Thank you, Steve. Well, good morning, and welcome to First English Baptist Church. I'm glad that you decided to join us for worship this morning. I'd like to welcome everybody here in the sanctuary, as well as those that will be joining us later online or um, on the radio. Uh, my name is Thelma Lauthard. I am the second of four guest speakers who will lead you while Pastor Lee and Annie are taking some time to relax and renew, and we welcome them to join us this morning. Uh, be sure to join us next Sunday when Jennifer Rarig and Lynn Warwick are here to share with the Ministry of Dwell Orphan Care, and then for Charlene out on the last Sunday of the month. Anne had asked me to make an announcement about Wednesday morning Bible study that Dave Ford will be leading the discussion. We're not sure what's going to happen because Dave had a medical incident while he was on vacation, so that's still up in the air. And I want to call your attention to the poster in the back about the church picnic on September 11th. Worship that day will start at 10 o'clock instead of at 9.25. And there's a sign-up sheet that you can um, fill in for what you'd like to bring to the picnic. As you know, I like to change things up a little bit. And so today we're going to start worship a little bit different. Many times when... American Baptist women get together, we begin with prayer and with a song. And oftentimes the song is, this is the day. Well, if you're not familiar with it, in a little bit, I'm going to have Steve play it through for us once. And, but I want to let you know that oftentimes clapping occurs during the song. So um, I'd like you to join me with that too. So Steve, if you want to play it through once. the words in got the words now we got the words now okay let's share with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for waking us up this morning and for giving us the ability to be here in this place to worship you. Thank you for the sunshine outside of our windows and for your sun shining through the smiling faces in this room. Be with us as we share in prayer to you, as we sing praises to you, as we listen to your word. May all we do this day bring honor and glory to your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning is taken from the book of Psalms. I'd like to read Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. I don't think we have any special music this morning, but Esther Franklin had a birthday this week, and so I'd like Esther to pick a song for us to sing. Number 300, what's the name? I come, to the garden. I, come, I come to the garden. Number 300. may be seated. At this time, if there's any children, uh, I'd like them to come up and share in the children's moment. I talked to them this morning, so hopefully they hear me and come out from the, nurse, the nursery. If there's anybody else that's young at heart that would like to come up and sit and hear the story also, I invite you to come up. And if the children don't come, I need people to come up. Here they come. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Go sit on the steps. Good. (laughs) 
Well, I wanted to tell you a story this morning from the Eager Reader Bible, Bible Studies to Grow On. But first I wanted to say that when my grandson Will was little, he liked stories from the Old Testament. And this is a story from the Old Testament. Because there was lots of adventure, and there was lots of action, and there was battles. And so this story this morning has a lot of excitement in it. So I want, want you to listen to it. And I want everybody to pay attention to this story because it's the prequel to the story that I'm going to read later. Okay? So, this is taken from the Old Testament book of Exodus. And it's from Exodus chapters 1 and 2. And it's baby Moses. I don't know if you want to, if you guys will be able to see the pictures or you just want to listen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Jacob's family lived in Egypt for many years. After 400 years, his family grew to be thousands and thousands of people. They call themselves Hebrews. The new king of Egypt didn't like this. These Hebrews will take over Egypt, he yelled. So the king made them slaves. He treated them very badly. They had to work for him and not be paid. The Hebrews kept having babies. The king didn't like that either. So he told his people to throw the Hebrew baby boys into the river. The Hebrew mothers were very, very sad. One Hebrew mother hid her baby boy. She kept him a secret for three months. When she could not hide him any longer, she made a boat out of a basket. She put him in it and placed the little boat on the river. The Egyptian princess found the little boat. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. The baby's big sister was nearby. Shall I get a Hebrew woman to feed him for you? She asked the princess. Yes, the princess said. So the girl ran and got her mother. The princess named the baby Moses. So God saved Moses' life, and Moses' mother got to take care of her own baby boy. Moses grew up in the king's house. He was a prince. One day, he killed a bad man who was beating a Hebrew slave. He had to leave Egypt. He went to a land far, far away. Years and years went by. In Egypt, the Hebrews were still slaves. Help us, God, they prayed. God heard their prayer. One day, Moses saw a burning bush. He thought, the bush burns and burns, but it doesn't burn into ashes. Then Moses heard God say, my people are hurting. I want to help them. Moses shook with fear and covered his face. I want you to lead my people out of Egypt, God said. You will take them to a good and wonderful land. Me? Moses asked. Yes, I will be with you, God answered. But what if the leaders don't listen to me, Moses asked. God made a stick turn into a snake. Then God said, miracles like this will make them listen. But I can't talk very well, Moses said. I made your mouth, God said. I will tell you what to say. Moses still didn't want to go. But God promised that Aaron, Moses' brother, would help. So Moses left for Egypt. Moses and Aaron went to the king of Egypt. You have made God's people your slaves, they said. God wants you to let them go. But the king answered, Who is God? Why should I listen to him? I am the king. The answer is no. God said to Moses, I will show that king who's boss. Then he will let my people go. So God made terrible things happen in Egypt. God turned the Nile River into blood. The Egyptians could not drink the water anymore. The king said, okay, you can go. But then God made the river turn into water again, and the king changed his mind. So God sent bunches and bunches of frogs. At first the king said, okay, you can go. But the frogs went away, and the king changed his mind again. 
Then clouds and clouds of gnats and flies came. Egypt's farm animals died. The Egyptians got sick. Hailstones knocked down many of their crops. Then grasshoppers ate the rest. It got dark at night for three full days. Sometimes the king would say, okay, you can go, or some of you can go. But each time the king would change his mind. And each time the king got madder and madder. After the three days of darkness, he said to Moses, my final answer is no, don't ask me again. Moses said, okay, I won't ask you again. The king of Egypt was very stubborn. God told him nine times to free the slaves, but each time the king said no. So God sent Moses to the king one more time. God has a message for you, king. Tonight, the oldest son in every family in Egypt will die. Even your own son will die. Then you will beg God's people to leave. The king got mad and Moses left. Moses said to the Hebrews, cook a special meal, have some lamb and some flatbread, and be ready to leave in the middle of your meal. Also, mark your door with some of the lamb's blood. This will show that you are God's people and your sons will not die. Then God said, that day will be a new holiday for you. It will be called Passover since I will pass over your houses when I punish the king. God's people did what God said, but the Egyptians didn't. And that night, the oldest son in every Egyptian family died. Even the king's oldest son died. But all the children of God's people were safe. Finally, the king said to Moses, take your people and go. So Moses, Aaron, and all of God's people left Egypt. This is how God rescued them from being slaves in Egypt. And then the story goes on about Moses separating the water so the people could walk through on dry land, but that's a story for another day, okay? Oh, thank you. God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. That was pretty spectacular, wasn't it? <laughs> do you think God can speak to kids today? Hmm? I do. I think he can. I think the Holy Spirit speaks to you when you choose to do the right thing. When you choose to be kind instead of mean to somebody. When you choose to include one of the new kids. Maybe you could sit by them at school or play with them on the playground. Um, maybe when you're coming off the school bus, if there's a new kid, you can talk to them as they walk home instead of just ignoring them. You know, I know you start school in a couple weeks, right? Yep, a couple weeks. Um. Oh, hi, Sam. Come on up. How are you today? Good, good. I'm glad you could join us. We're just talking about <clears throat> Moses and the burning bush. That was our story this morning, and how God can use kids, even kids your age, that you're going back to school in a couple weeks, right? And that um, there are ways that you can be kind to people when you're at school, right? You can, maybe your mom and dad has had a bad day at work and they ask you to do something and you really don't want to do it. But you do it because it's the right thing to do and it'll help them, you know? Um, when you go back to school this time, I want you to look for ways that God can use you to be kind to other people and to share his love, okay? And then in a couple weeks from now, when you come back to church, tell me about some of the things that God's using you to do, okay, at school? Okay, let's share in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our children in this church. We thank you for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and our nieces and nephews and godchildren and the kids up the street. We pray, dear God, that you would be with them as they head back to school. We pray that you will watch over them and keep them safe on school buses, in classrooms, in the cafeteria, on the playground, and their after-school activities. We pray, dear God, that you would be with our teachers, 
and our coaches and our administrators and everybody that's involved with our children this year. We ask that you would use them to share your love through them, that each of our children may feel loved and wanted, and that each will have a successful year at school. We pray all these things in thy holy name. Amen. Thank you for coming up. You can go down the stairs now for Children's Church. Thank you, Aaron and Becky. <laughs> okay, please stand with me now as we sing our hymn of faith, number 405. My hope is built on nothing less. be seated. At this time is our prayer time and Pastor Lee has asked if he can come and share this time with us this morning. Good morning. I haven't lost track of time. <laughs> um, no, my wife and I were just driving by this lovely church and we thought we'd stop for see what, what was going on here, and it's a lovely congregation, so glad to, glad to see everyone. Um, it is good to see everyone. We've been enjoying our vacation. Um, I've actually been able to relax some, which is actually an accomplishment. Um, we had previously planned to go to Asheville to visit my parents, but we actually canceled that because of the rise of COVID cases and and my folks are getting up in age, and we just didn't want to risk exposing them. They, they've gotten it once. I don't want them to, to relapse into something. So um, actually, we would have been driving to Asheville right now. Uh, so I'm glad that we're here. I was surprised to get the, the text message yesterday from Sandy and then the prayer request from Thelma. I didn't know about the fire last week in Nescopec, the terrible tragedy uh, and loss there, and then uh, the, the terrible violence last night uh, at the fundraiser. Uh, I'm sure it's as shocking to you as to me and anybody else, and maybe you know some of the people. I know that our um, friend Christina, who is a social worker at Geisinger, was there late into the night helping the chaplains with the family members and the people that have 
suffered injuries that are at the hospital. But I, I just felt I wanted to be here to pray with you for these situations and offer some reassurance. Not that I didn't think Thelma wouldn't do an excellent job at that, but since I'm here, uh, that was my thought. And I checked with her and she was okay with it. So um, I would like to lead us in prayer this morning, particularly because of those tragedies in our, in our neighborhood. Um, but of course, we have other concerns we're praying about. And as we normally do, if you'd like to offer names of people you're praying for, we'll include those in our prayer this morning. Russ. Joe and Dave. Joe Murphy is that? He who has COVID. I don't know if you know that, but he's one of our most cautious members. And, and, but I talked to him yesterday. He's actually doing okay. But yes, let's pray for Joe. And who else did you say? And Dave Ford. That was the other message last night too. I guess he's not as in serious condition as maybe they thought, um, but are watching him in the hospital. So that's good. Grace. Barb and Madison, Ann, Kathy, Joe. Kathy, Joe, and Sam, RJ, Darlene, and RJ, yes, Karen, Mary, Bob, and Mary, Bob, and Randy, Marcy, Mike, Donna, Linda, Rayu, Jude, Coy, Diane, Doris, Paulo, Clyde, Chris, and Barb, Jeannie, Beth Ann and the Angst family, Dave, Ed, Mike, and Mark, Eileen, Joe, Dave, and Jack, Janet, Charles, and Larry, and and Janet, definitely. Eleanor, Sally, good to see you both here too. Michelle, Rosie, Bob and Jean. yes, Rosie, Bob, and Jean, thank you. Russ again, Ara Lee, and Brenda. Donna, you got one more? Two more. Asidro? Uh huh. Laura. Laura. And Ethan. Okay, very good. Esther. Bill and Judy. No, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you all. Would you bow with me as we bring our concerns to the Lord in prayer? Gracious, loving, Heavenly Father, thank you for this new day and delivering us here. Thank you for the beauty of the world around us and of this season. Our hearts go out this morning, Lord, to those who are suffering and struggling, particularly our neighbors and friends up the road in Berwick and in Nescopec, who've su suffered such tragic loss in the last hours and who continue to struggle and suffer, many of them in the hospital and their family members uh, anxiously awaiting and, and praying for recovery and healing. We join them in that prayer and all of our community as we pray together for these who have been so terribly victimized. Uh, we, we pray, O oh Lord, for healing. We pray for strength. We pray for comfort. We pray for neighbors and friends as we pull together to support one another in time of hardship and loss. We pray for all of these friends and loved ones that we've named out loud this morning. You know each one. You know the ones that we have not named but are also on our hearts. Each of these we lift to you, Lord, in prayer. We, we treasure them and we know that they are, they are dear children of yours. We ask in your mercy to deliver them through the challenge and the struggle that they face today whether it be physical or spiritual, but mental or social, economic, all of the ways that life can apply pressure and hurt, we pray for relief. We pray for light to guide them, the light of Jesus, into the, into the place of refuge and strength and, and salvation. 
we thank you, Lord, that it is in our times of greatest need that you are closest and that we experience your love in the most powerful ways. And we pray that in these difficult times, that awareness would strengthen and deepen our faith and our confidence that you love us and that you care for this world. We look around us and we see so much suffering, needless suffering and struggling and, and humans hurting each other and uh, bringing hurt and destruction and, and isolation and trauma in ways that we can hardly imagine. We see more and more the evidence of the need of your love and of your people to reach beyond ourselves to those around us and share with them the love that we know. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. We pray that in these times of hardship and loss, your power and your faith in us would translate into actions of love and care and mercy. We pray for people in other places beyond our immediate area, those struggling against war and famine and fire and, and storm, those whose lives have been disrupted in ways beyond their control. And we ask for the mercy of your spirit upon all of us. Guide us, Lord, in the light of Christ to be your people, your body here on earth. Help each of us claim those abilities that you have given us to serve one another and to serve you. We may not be like others around us, but each of us has a gift to share and an opportunity that no one else has. May we see those opportunities for love and kindness and act on them as you guide us. We thank you, Lord, for this faithful congregation, for the prayers of many people, and for your love that holds us. Hear us now as we remember together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite the ushers to come forward to receive this morning's gifts and tithes.
share with me in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to give back just a small portion of the riches that you have given to us. We ask that you would bless these gifts, that we might use them to bring your kingdom here on earth, within our community and our world. Bless the gift and the giver alike. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's message is from Max Licato's book, They Walked with God, 40 Bible Characters Who Inspired Us. I purchased this book earlier this summer and was surprised at how big it was. <laughs> I thought, I'll never get through it. But on the contrary, I enjoyed every story and it went very, very quickly. So I wanted to share one of them with you this morning. You may have read some of Max Licato's books. Um, I have several of his children's books. I've used them for children's church before. Um, our women have done several of his Bible studies. And he has an online presence with a daily devotion. I believe he started that at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and that was really, really helpful. He's one of America's best-selling inspirational authors with more than 145 million products in print. So today I'd like to share a story from the book. I hope you were paying attention during the children's moment because that's going to give you a synopsis of the character that we're going to hear about today. Each story is prefaced with a scripture reading and the scripture for this story is taken from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 and then verses 9 and 10. So, let me begin. But I have to put these on so I can see this tiny print. It doesn't matter how big I make the print. It's hard to see here. Okay. Moses was tending the... This is the scripture taken from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 and 9 and 10. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, but the bush does not burn. Then the, when the Lord saw what he had done and gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. God said, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are opposing them. So now go. I am sending you to the Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. The hallway is silent except for the wheels of the mop bucket and the shuffle of the old man's feet. Both sound tired. Both know these floors. How many nights had Hank cleaned them? Always careful to get in the corners Always careful to set up his yellow caution sign warning of wet floors. Always chuckling as he does. Be careful, everyone, he laughs to himself, knowing no one is near. Not at 3 a.m. Hank's health isn't what it used to be. Gout keeps him awake. Arthritis makes him limp. His glasses are so thick his eyeballs look twice their size. Shoulders stoop. But he does his work, slopping soapy water on linoleum, scrubbing the heel marks left by the well-heeled lawyers. He'll be finished an hour before quitting time, always finishes early, has for 20 years. When finished, he'll put away his bucket and take a seat outside the office of the senior partner and wait. Never leaves early. Could. No one would know. But he doesn't. He broke the rules once. 
never again. Sometimes, if the door is open, he'll enter the office. Not for long, just to look. The suite is larger than his apartment. He once had such an office. Back when Hank was Henry. Back when the custodian was an executive. Long ago. Before the night shift. Before the mop bucket. Before the maintenance uniform. Before the scandal. Hank doesn't think much about it now. Got in trouble, got fired, and got out. That's it. Not many people know about it. It's his secret. Hank's story, by the way, is true. I changed the name and a detail or two. I gave him a different job and put him in a different century. But the story is factual. You've heard it. You know it. When I give you his real name, you'll remember. But more than a true story, it's a common story. It's a story of a derailed dream. It's a story of high hopes colliding with harsh realities. Happens to all dreamers. And since all have dreamed, it happens to us. In Hank's case, it was a mistake he could never forget. A grave mistake. Hank kills someone. He came upon a criminal beating up an innocent man, and Hank lost control. He killed the mugger. When word got out, Hank got out. Hank would rather hide than go to jail. The executive becomes a fugitive. True story, common story. Most stories aren't as extreme as Hank's. Few spend their lives running from the law. Many, however, live with regrets. I could have gone to college on a golf scholarship, a fellow told me on the golf course. Had an offer right out of school. But I joined a rock and roll band. Ended up never going. Now I'm stuck fixing garage doors. Now I'm stuck. Epitaph of a derailed dream. Pick up a high school yearbook and read the what I want to do sentence under each picture. You'll get dizzy breathing the air of mountaintop visions. Yet, take the yearbook to a 20th year reunion and read the next chapter. Some dreams have come true, but many haven't. Not all should, mind you. I hope the little guy who dreamed of being a sumo wrestler came to his senses. And I hope he didn't lose his passion in the process. Changing direction in life is not tragic. Losing passion in life is. Something happens to us along the way. Convictions to change the world, downgrade to commitments to pay the bills. Rather than make a difference, we make a salary. Rather than look forward, we look back. Rather than look outward, we look inward. And we don't like what we see. Hank didn't. Hank saw a man who settled for mediocre. Trained in the finest institutions of the world, yet working the night shift in a minimum wage job so he wouldn't be seen in the day. But all that changed when he heard the voice from the mop bucket. At first he thought it was a joke. Some of the fellows on the third floor play these kinds of tricks. Henry! Henry! The voice called. Hank turned. No one called him Henry anymore. Henry! Henry! He turned towards the pail. It was glowing. Bright red. Hot red. He could feel the heat ten feet away. He stepped closer and looked in. The water wasn't boiling. This is strange, Hank mumbled to himself as he took another step to get a closer look. But the voice stopped him. Don't come any closer. Take off your shoes. You are on holy tile. Suddenly, Hank knew who was speaking. God? I'm not making this up. I know you think I am. Sounds crazy. Almost irreverent. God speaking from a hot mop bucket to a janitor named Hank? 
Would it be believable if I said God was speaking from a burning bush to a shepherd named Moses? Maybe that one's easier to handle because you've heard it before. But just because it's Moses and a bush rather than Hank and a bucket, it's no less spectacular. It sure shocked the sandals off Moses. We wonder what amazed the old fellow more, that God spoke in a bush or that God spoke at all. Moses, like Hank, had made a mistake. You remember his story. Adopted nobility, an Israelite reared in an Egyptian palace. His countrymen were slaves, but Moses was privileged, ate at the royal table, educated in the finest schools. But his most influential teacher had no degree. She was his mother, a Jewess who was hired to be his nanny. Moses, you can almost hear her whisper to her young son, God has put you here on purpose. Someday you will set your people free. Never forget, Moses. Never forget. Moses didn't. The flame of justice grew hotter until it blazed. Moses saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. Just like Hank killed the mugger, Moses killed the Egyptian. The next day, Moses saw the Hebrew. You'd think the slave would say thanks. He didn't. Rather than express gratitude, he expressed anger. Will you kill me too? He asked. Moses knew he was in trouble. He fled Egypt and hid in the wilderness. Call it a career shift. He went from dining with heads of state to counting heads of sheep. And so it happened that a bright, promising Hebrew began herding sheep in the hills. Moses thought the move was permanent. There's no indication he ever intended to go back to Egypt. In fact, there is every indication he wanted to stay with his sheep. Standing barefoot before the bush, he confessed, I am not a great man. How can I go to the king and lead the Israelites out of Egypt? I'm glad Moses asked that question. It's a good one. Why Moses? Or more specifically, why 80-year-old Moses? The 40-year-old version was more appealing. The Moses we saw in Egypt was brash and confident, but the Moses we find four decades later is reluctant and weather-beaten. Had you or I looked at Moses back in Egypt, we would have said, this man is ready for battle educated in the finest systems in the world, trained by the ablest soldiers, instant access to the inner circle of the Pharaoh. Moses spoke their language and knew their habits. He was the perfect man for the job. Moses at 40, we like. But Moses at 80? No way. Too old, too tired, smells like a shepherd. What impact would he have on Pharaoh? He's the wrong man for the job. And Moses would have agreed. Tried that once before, he would say, those people don't want to be helped. Just leave me here to tend my sheep. They're easier to lead. Moses wouldn't have gone. You wouldn't have sent him. I wouldn't have sent him. But God did. How do you figure? Benched at 40 and suited up at 80. Why? What does he know now that he didn't know then? What did he learn in the desert that he didn't learn in Egypt? The ways of the desert, for one. 40-year-old Moses was a city boy. Octogenarian Moses knows the name of every snake and the location of every watering hole. If he's going to lead thousands of Hebrews into the wilderness, he better know the basics of Desert Life 101. Family dynamics for another. If he's going to be traveling with families for 40 years, it might help to understand how they work. He marries a woman of faith, the daughter of a Midianite priest, and establishes his own family. But more than the ways of the desert and the people, Moses needed to learn a thing or two about himself. Apparently he has learned it. 
God said Moses is ready. And to convince him, God speaks through a bush. School's out, God tells him. Now it's time to get to work. Poor Moses. He didn't even know he was enrolled. But he was. And guess what? So are you. The voice from the bush is the voice that whispers to you. It reminds you that God is not finished with you yet. Oh, you may think he is. You may think you've peaked. You may think he's got someone else to do the job. But think again. Philippians 1 verse 6 said, God began doing a good work in you, and I am sure he will continue it until it is finished when Jesus Christ comes again. He may speak through a bush, a mop bucket, or stranger still, he may speak through this bush, through this book. A couple questions for you. Would you have given Moses the job of bringing Israel out of slavery? What do you think God saw in Moses? What do you think he might see in you? What do you think God may still be calling you to do? You know, we probably won't hear God speaking to us from a burning bush or over the loudspeaker at a football game or even on the jumbotron of a major league baseball game. But let me refresh your memory of a text from 1 King chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. God was speaking to Elijah, who, like Moses, had run away, and also, like Moses, had killed. Interestingly, Elijah, like Moses, was also on Horeb, the mountain of God. Elijah was hiding in a cave when God spoke to him. 1 King chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Do you think God still whispers to his people today? To you and to me? I believe he does. And we'll make the decision whether to listen to him or to ignore him. I believe God spoke to one of my friends and touched her heart the day she put her whole offering and all she had into the love gift offering. I believe God spoke through two people on two different airplanes to someone who needed to be reassured of a medical treatment. I believe God speaks through children, pastors, friends, strangers, and maybe even family members. We just need to be open to hearing his voice and to be aware of opportunities for him to speak. It could be in the produce aisle at the grocery store. It could be at the garden center at Walmart, in the classroom where you teach, or on your nightly walk with your dog. As in the case with Moses, you're never too old, or for that matter, you're never too young, for God to use you to bring his kingdom here on earth. Open your ears. And as Pastor Lee reminded us a couple of weeks ago in his message, we all have ears. And open your heart to hear God's call. Please share with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to be aware of your daily presence in our lives. Of times when you whisper in our ears to see or hear someone or something where we can make a difference. Open us up to really listening for your voice and that because of you working through us, we can change the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Please stand with me as we sing our hymn of commitment, Lord Speak to Me, number 593. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today and always. Amen. <laughs>